Hello everyone and welcome to the very first interview on the Media and Culture Department's YouTube channel. In this video, we are having a chat with Magdalena Gorska, one of the Gender Studies lecturers who has published a really interesting book, Breathing Matters, Feminist Intersectional Politics of Vulnerability. Um, Magdalena will tell us some more about her interests with gender studies, um, the writing process of her book, and other current projects she is working on. So thank you, Magdalena, for joining the interview. Uh, I hope you're doing well in these very strange times. Yes, thank you so much for having me and uh, and for for initiating this uh, this series of uh, videos and conversations. I'm looking forward to watching all of them. <laughs> well, thank you for joining. Um, of course, a lot of students within gender studies know you, but for all other students and aspiring students, it would be nice if you could tell a bit more about yourself. So I'm assistant professor in the, uh, the graduate uh, gender studies program. I've been teaching here since 2016. And, uh, and I work with a broad uh, team of gender studies uh, specialists and my own specialization focuses on politics of vulnerability, uh, politics of breathing, because this is my, um, my interest. And uh, I work a lot with theories of affect, embodiment, feminist philosophies. And yeah, what made you um, pursue a career in gender studies? I think it started with, you know, being interested in social justice, in understanding uh, how structures of power work in society. So I think already, you know, um, when I was a teenager, I was interested in, in those questions and I was um, frustrated about social injustices I've seen around me. And that was when I lived in Poland, but also in Czech Republic. And then when I studied uh, at the university on a BA level, I met uh, one professor, Viera Sokolova, who made an earthquake in my world with feminist theory. And this is exactly why I decided to stick to it, because I think um, gender studies and feminist theories can open our perspectives on, on the way how we see it and understand society and can help us to develop a society which is more just and which uh, challenges in the inequalities in, in our current times right so this is yeah. this was the motivation why why i kind of uh, decided to stick with it yeah for students that don't know you um, what kind of courses do you teach at the university so i teach uh, across uh, courses in uh, ma1 program but also in research master program at the graduate gender studies program so on uh, MA1 level, I teach, for example, course feminist research practice, where I'm uh, introducing students to the way how you can do research from pe feminist perspective and what different tools can you use. And uh, the course is very much practice based uh, in a sense that we read theories, but students learn in every week assignments how to apply them into specific research questions they have. Or I teach course such as Soma Techniques, for example, which is a course when we under, uh, engage with questions of embodiment and power tech and technology. And that's yeah. also where I teach a little bit about breathing. And you're very focused on the subject breathing. Yeah, what, what does this mean? What is your research focus? Well, why are you so passionate about this? Yeah, so in my work, I've been always interested in the question of agency of embodiment. So when we think about our bodies, what bodies do? We, uh, we are often taught that body is just a container for who we are as a human being. But, um, and this is the Cart uh, Cartesian heritage of our thinking, but um, from my perspective, which I build also on, uh, on you know, um, a very wide range of feminist philosophy of embodiment, uh, from my perspective and perspective of those scholars, um, embodiment is much more, it's not just a container. It has agency, bodies are us, we are bodies. And in that sense, um, I was really interested in how we can th think this agency is something political. And at some point I came up with the idea of breathing because I think breathing is something which we all share, but it is also something which we share differently. Because when we think about breathing, we think, oh, we are all breathing human beings. First of all, not only human bre uh, breathes, and that's my post-humanist perspective, but I will not go into it now. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, also all humans breathe uh, universally, but also differentially, in a sense that um, 
we breathe differently according to our age. We breathe differently according to our bodily constitution. We breathe uh, differently uh, according to our positions in, in society in relation to power. And that's something which is uh, a little bit counterintuitive. But uh, the point of that is that if you, for example, are part of the privileged group, and often when you think about environmental toxicity, uh, toxic environments are environments uh, which are inhabited by uh, the privileged uh, people. And so, for example, if, if you live in a toxic environment where you breathe polluted air, this is not only an environmental uh, issue or individual issue, it is a structural issue of how we, how we attend to breathability of our lives and whose lives are, are breathable and whose are not. So for me, breathing is a way of engaging this social power relations from the perspective also of embodiment. Brought out a book about the subject. What is the overall message of this book? What, what did you find out? Breathing, of course, uh, um, is, not, uh, is something which has been discussed very much by many different philosophies, many different cultures and so on. But what I was, I've been trying to do uh, in this book is actually attend to breathing in its everyday practices. So, for example, I talk about breathing with anxieties and panic attacks. This very kind of convoluted, difficult, sometimes very shallow, sometimes explosive breathing. And I'm thinking about the way how our embodiment and affect are mutually constitutive and how they are constitutive also together with power relations. For example, the way how, uh, you know, uh, certain groups of people or certain individuals um, suffer with depression is connected to specific social structures we inhabit. Uh, in a similar way, as I was talking about environmental toxicity, we can also talk about uh, social toxicity, such as racism, ableism, and so on. Yeah. Do you think that if you would write this book now, do you think it's your, your perception on breathing would be different? Well, I think what is really great about breathing is, and that's something which I didn't say, but of course this is how I think about breathing in, in the book and in general, is that it challenges our understanding of what is human and what is not human, what is inside and what is outside. Because with breathing you can see that uh, the boundaries of our bodies are much, uh, much less stable than we think. It's not only that they are porous, like the skin is porous, but actually the fact that we, well, now we are not sitting in the same room, but let's say a few months ago, we would sit in the same room and we would literally breathe each other. Mm -hmm. Because we share the air which we breathe. And on top of it, our breathing is full of information. Humans cannot uh, decode the information because our noses are not so sen sensitive to be able to find the information in our breath. But for example, dogs are able to do it. So uh, for example, assistance dogs, and I live with an assistance dog myself, an assistance dog can smell from your breath if your panic attack is coming up. Because if you Whoa. have... Yeah. <laughs> Because I didn't it, know that. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 what is fascinating about breathing. It's a much more complex process than what we usually think about. And so, for example, because uh, if adrenaline level increases in our body, uh, our breath smells differently. And so that the dog can learn that this particular kind of smell is a smell of your panic attack, uh, attack cam coming. So in that sense, this is like one of the things which I find is really important about breathing also today, that we should uh, not only think about, um, you know, being afraid of contaminating each other through breath, but also realizing how much we share and how this sharing should be an accountability for our social and environmental justice approach, which we need to develop for the future. Yeah, exactly. Does this also link to your project, uh, Breathable Futures? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Could you tell maybe a bit more about that project? <laughs> yes, so, so this project started, uh, I was in quarantine already from um, uh, since uh, 8th of March because I got sick myself. I oh, don't no. know. Yes, I don't know if it was Corona or not because I never got tested, so I don't know. Yeah. But uh, apparently it looks like it probably was. And um, so I was in quarantine a little bit and I had some, some time to 
you know, read a little bit about what, what was happening, how people were thinking about it. And then I came across one article, which is uh, by Arundhati Roy, which is called The Pandemic is a Portal. And in this article, she talks about the current moment as a portal to the next world. And she says that nothing could be worse than a return to normality. And so I was walking around with this quotation in my head. And one morning I just uh, realized that I would like to talk with people about, um, about what it would mean not to return to reality. Uh, sorry, not to return to normality. So what would it mean to not to return to normality? And what can we do to make uh, the future a better place, if I say it in this kind of more simplistic terms? And uh, and that's how the project was born. So I contacted some people and asked them if they would like to do interviews. And I started interviewing them. Right now, um, only one article is published, even though four in total were conducting, because it takes me quite some time to get it out there. But the whole idea of the uh, of of the project is about talking with people and asking how we can. Um, think of current moment as a possibility for change, even though this moment is also very difficult and painful and we cannot forget about it. And maybe one more thing to add to that, which I think is also very important, is how we can think about the virus not as something which we need to wage war against, but as something that, that actually or something which is the, the source of our suffering today. The suffering doesn't come from the virus itself. It comes also from already existing structures of inequality in our society. And I think virus became a microscope, which just shows us this in even more intensified ways. But of course, groups of people who have been marginalized have seen that already before. And I think this is also very important. Yeah, if, if viewers, if you want to see uh, how the project is going, just I'll put the link in the description box so you can check it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think uh, I was just curious if there's anything else you would like to share with the viewers. That I think we should organize and keep unionizing because in, um, structures of support are really important right now. And I know that students have a lot of struggles in relation to uh, the fees they have to pay, in relation to losing jobs, uh, in relation to you know accommodation and also mental health issues and physical issues and so on. So I would say let's use this opportunity to create stronger student unions and teachers unions and let's try to work together on making university work for us. Well, thank you so much, Magdalena, for having a talk. Thank and you. it was fun. Yeah, and I hope you stay safe. And we'll talk maybe in the future again. I will be happy to. And thank you for, the, for inviting me for this interview. <laughs>